Welcome to our fourth video on the free and open source default game engine. In this video, we are continuing from the previous video and build a detect and attack behavior for our skeleton enemy. For this to work, we have to implement trigger detection, collision enabling and disabling, frame count detection to synchronize the hitbox enabling with the frame animation, and finally applying the damage to the player. Seems easy, but that has some interesting implications on default, and we will look into the solution with all the detail to allow you to make it yours. Without any further delay, let's jump into the default game engine. But before implementing the new detection and attach behaviors, let's solve some problems associated with the last tutorial. If we look into our characters moving through the level, we can see that for no apparent reason they stop moving as if something is blocking them. That something is the physics blocks that we have set on our tile map, and the collision boxes that we have implemented in our character, that are not interacting in the best of ways. Let's check how we can solve this issue. The first thing is to try to see what is happening because at this stage we can only try to guess. Let's enable the physics as debugging, which will allow us to see the physics blocks in different colors. For this, in the game project view, double click on the file, game project. When the file is open in the editor, scroll down to the physics elements and click on the checkbox debug. If we run the game again, we can see that the game view is now showing all the physics elements with different colors which can help us trace where the problem could be located. Looking into detail, we can see that the problem seems to be associated with the fact that we are using for the characters collision groups with box shapes, which seems to create some problems on the edges. Let's replace them in both the player and the enemy the collision shape from a box to a circle that should be smoother. Let's resize and place it correctly over the character. We should use another one for the top of the character, but since for now, all our blows will be happening near the ground, we can keep it this way. Since we have not changed the collision group, we don't need to modify the groups and the masks. Let's replicate the changes into the player character too. Let's run the game to see if we have solved the problem. Yes, we can see that both the enemy and the player can now move without getting stuck on the level. But, we can see that we have a problem, the collider is not flipping as the character, and even so, the collider is below the game object that flips, it is still oriented in the same direction after the flip. After having tried several options, like rotating the game object, and other options, we have discovered that to solve this problem, we need to actually explicitly flip the collider to with a specific function from default's physics library. So, in the update animation function, after the character sprite flipping, let's add a new line to flip the collider that we are using for the range. Type in physics set h flip, as we are flipping horizontally, and then the path to the collider that we intend to flip and the value true. Let's replicate the flip for the hitbox collider. Let's run the game. Hmm, it seems that we have an error. Okay, we have typed physic and not physics. Let's add the S. Let's try again to run the game. Okay, seems to run. Will it flip the collider? Nope, the character sprite has flipped correctly but not the colliders. We must be missing something. Let's check the code again. 
We need to take into account the value of the movement direction to decide on whatever to flip or not the collider. So, let's add an if statement to check the value of the variable movement, and based on if it is bigger or smaller than zero, we will flip or not the collider. In our specific case, if the movement is bigger than zero, then we will flip and else if lower than zero, we will set the flip to false. Let's check it. No, the character is not flipping and it is getting stuck on the wall. Seems to be related to the collision with walls function in the main code. Let's check it. In the previous video tutorial, we included a check on if the movement was equal to zero, as to set the wall contact to true and to change the direction of the movement, but it is disabling the capacity of the system to change the direction of the movement. Let's assign it the x value of the normal return from the collision with the wall. It will point in the opposite direction and there so, should become the new direction. Let's run the game and let's wait for the collision with the wall. The skeleton is correctly turning away and the skeleton colliders are flipping correctly. Now, let's try to detect the player. Let's go to the function on message where default is receiving all messages being received by the game object. Copy the last lines associated with detecting the wall collision and paste it afterward. We will use it as the basis for processing the messages coming from the player. For this, modify the group wall with the group player and wall contact with player contact. Replace the function name handle wall contact with handle player contact. Go up to the function definition and copy it to create the new handle player contact. Let's remove most of the code inside the function as we will not need it, and let's make a quick check on it is working by printing to the console a debug message player detected. Now, let's go create the local variables and hash message for the player contact and group player. Player contact is initialized as false. We need now to adjust the group associated with the player. Go to the main collection view, and select the player object. Then click on the collision object and scroll down to the mask field. You can see that now we have only listed the ground. So let's add the enemy separated by a comma this will make the player and enemy interact on the physics level. Let's build the game. Let's see if the enemy is now detecting the player. Nope. Not yet. Seems strange, let's check the definitions of the hash messages. Yes, we have a typo. We typed layer instead of player. While looking for the error, we have seen that we had copied the code for the reception of the collision messages in the wrong place. Default has different ways to process physics messages contact point, collision, and trigger. We have been using the contact points to address the collisions between the ground and the objects. Contact points responses are sent several times per frame, which allows for a more precise interaction. Collision and trigger responses are only sent once per frame. Triggers responses are generated only if any of the colliders is a trigger. We are going to link to the documentation in the description. This means that we should have put the code the reception of the message of the collision between the enemy and the player while testing for the collision or the trigger response. Let's fix this. We are going to use for now the collision response. First thing is to create a new local variable to keep the hash value of the type collision response. Let's name it MSG collision response. Now, let's go back to the onMessage function, and let's cut out the code that we added previously for the player collisions. Let's add a new if condition where we are going to test if the message that we are receiving is of type collision response, in which case we will then execute the previous code. Let's test it now. 
Let's wait for the enemy and the player to touch. And it has recognized correctly the collision. Let's add now some basic code on the function that handles player contact. The first thing is to set the value of the variable player contact to be true. Then let's stop the enemy by setting the value of the variable movement to zero. Finally, let's play the attack animation for the enemy. Let's test it. And now we have an attack animation. Let's now implement the damage. To apply damage in a game, you have to perform several actions at the same time. Take into consideration that in this example we are implementing a melee combat with swords being used. For other types of mechanics like fire guns, grenades, missiles, laser beams, and other weapons it will be different. You have first to play the attack animation, which we have just finished implementing, then, you need a hitbox that will detect if your weapon is in contact with the enemy that he is trying to damage. Usually, hitboxes are implemented through the use of triggers. If you have been listening carefully, you will remember that we just said that one of the physics messages exchanged by default when two physics-enabled objects are touching, is a trigger response. So, let's implement our hitbox for the enemy. For that, go to the top of the script, and just after the line where we have defined the hash function for the collision response, let's copy the line, and let's change it to be trigger response. Now, let's go back to the onMessage function, and let's add a new condition to test if the incoming message is of type trigger response. Since we want to apply damage only when the game object is entering the hitbox, we will add a new condition to test if the message has been generated when the physic body was entering the hitbox with message.enter. If it is the case, then let's call for the function that will apply the damage to the object, which in this situation will be the player. So, let's replace contact with damage. At this stage, any message generated by any trigger interacting from the player and the enemy would apply damage to the player. We don't want that to happen. We want it to occur only when the hitbox is the trigger that is overlapping the player. To perform this check, let's add to the condition testing if the message is a trigger response, a check on who has sent the message. This information is accessible through the fragment property of the message. So, let's check if the fragment is equal to hitbox. Hitbox, if you don't remind it, is the name of the trigger that we have created in our enemy collection. Let's create now the function to handle the player damage. Let's copy the function for the player contact and use it as the base for the damage. Let's modify the debug message to be making damage to player. And let's apply the damage by sending to the player script a message with the damage that we want to apply. The action is performed by using the function msg post that receives as parameters the URL of the object where the message is to be sent, and the ID of the message that we want to reach on the object. So in our case, we want to send a message to player, player script and run the function simple damage. Now, let's open the player script by going to the main collection and opening it from the player hierarchy. First thing to do, is every time we are receiving messages in default, is to define the hash function of the message and save it in a local variable. So, let's do it for the simple damage message, and let's save it in the local variable msg simple damage. Now, let's scroll down to the on message function on the player script,
and let's check if the incoming message is of type simple damage. In which case let's call a function named handle player damage which will implement the damage by reducing the health of the player. Create the function, and inside type the code that is going to reduce the player health amount by 10, which is the amount of life that we want to apply at this stage. Later on, if we have other types of attacks we can implement different levels of damages. Let's print to the console a debug message with the amount of health left in the player. Let's go to the initialization area at the top of the script and let's define the player health and set it to start at 100. Just in case, let's make it 100 also in the init function. Up to now, we have detected the collision between the hitbox and the player, we have sent the damage to the player and we have reduced the health by a small amount of damage. We have not yet tested it. But before doing so, we need another feature that is important in melee combats. Usually when you attack with a sword the damage that it can generate is only located at a specific place in the movement. For example, a sword cannot perform any damage if is starting an anticipation movement, or if finishing the attack. Depending on the number of frames of animations, the specific impact will only be happening in a couple of very precise frames. Let's implement it in default. For that, we need to detect which frame is being played. This is something that is not very easy to get from the default engine, but that we can work around. So, all our animations are getting played in the function update animation. Let's add to the beginning of the function, a new call to a function that will check which is the current frame of animation being played by the animation system. As a parameter, we will pass the name of the attack animation, and an indication on the frame that we want to use to trigger the damage. In our case, you can see that the frame where we want to apply the damage is starting on frame 7. Since we have 17 frames, the number that we will pass to the function is 7 divided by 17, or the frame in percentage. Let's create now the function check frame. First thing that we need to do, is to check if the animation that is currently playing is the right one, in which case, we will use the method cursor to retrieve the percentage of animation being played. This is done by using a special message in default named cursor, and that returns in percentage, the current state of the animation running. Let's compare the value returned with the frame where we want to apply the damage, and let's make sure also, that the animation has not gone over a certain upper limit after which it would improbable that any damage could be done. If it is the case, then, let's enable the hitbox in the hierarchy of our skeleton enemy, by sending it a message with the identifier enable.
once past that window, let's disable it again, to stop applying damage to any game object touching the hitbox. Let's save and run the game. The enemy is moving. And when detecting the player plays the attack animation and we can see that some damage has been applied to the player with the life coming down to 90. In default, when an animation has finished playing, a message with ID animation done is sent to the game object to allow detecting when the animation has finished playing. and use it to set the variable as attacking to false. Let's also address the situation where the player gets out of the attack range of the enemy, which would be to leave the area of the trigger that detects the enemy in range. So, let's go to the onMessage function, and after the code that we have added to detect when a game object is entering the trigger, let's add a new condition testing if the message received is equal to exit. Let's copy the code that makes sure that we are dealing with the player, and replace the handle player damage by setting the value of his attacking to false. Now, let's implement some basic attack timings and attack rates to make the attacks from the skeleton enemy somewhat more interesting. So, at the top of the script, let's add a couple of timing variables, the time between attacks that we will be set to 2, and the timer attack which will hold the actual time to 0. Now, let's go to the function where we launch the attack and let's add the timers to control how fast the enemy can attack. So, if the enemy is attacking and the timer attack is lesser or equal to 0, we will launch the attack. After the attack, in case the timer attack is greater than 0, let's reduce its value by 0.04. Now, when the enemy has finished playing the attack animation, let's set the timer attack to the value of the variable time between attacks. This will make the enemy hold this time before actually attacking again. Not the prettiest code, but functional for what we want to do at this stage. Let's run the game. And we can see that the enemy is now attacking and causing damage to the player taking into account the basic attack rate that we have defined. We would be missing the death of the player, but we will keep it for another video as this one is already long. In the next episode, we continue with the player's death and replicate the damage functions from the player to the enemy to make the combat more even. We hope that you have liked this video. If it has been the case, consider subscribing, giving a like, and clicking on the notification button. If you have any questions, problems, or comments, don't hesitate in putting a comment and we will answer as fast as we could. See you in the next video game developers.